Great. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. My name is Jeff DeBelco, direct the Environmental Change and Security Project here. And it's really a thrill to host this morning's session. Uh, many of you know the work of Thomas Homer Dixon. Uh, he is uh, very well known to this program and project. Uh, we're a 12 year old program, the Environmental Change and Security Project here at the Wilson Center, a nonpartisan, non advocacy forum to bring together the worlds of both scholarship and policy. Uh, but also, in particular, environment, population, health, development, and understand them in broader foreign and security policy contexts. And I think it's fair to say that there are a few, if, if any, scholars in the last 15 years who have more directly looked at these linkages and uh, more directly been looked to to help us understand these linkages. Uh, Tad Homer Dixon is someone who has been uh, active and supportive and contributing his thoughts on paper and in person to the work of the Environmental Change and Security Program, particularly in those early years when we were really trying to understand very, we're narrowly focused on the questions of environment, demography, and, and conflict. Tad was at those very first meetings and um, it was an exciting time in 1994 when the first, his second international security piece uh, came out and, and subsequently Robert Kaplan's uh, piece that uh, also featured Tad's work so prominently. So Tad has been a, a common contributor to our publications and um, has been kind enough to when he's in town, when he has a new book and has new research to share, has always been willing to stop at the Wilson Center and share that with us. So we're very, we're great, very grateful for him doing that. I should also say on a personal note, Tad uh, is uh, as someone right, who wrote his dissertation on this evolution of environment security ideas. Tad was very gracious in terms of opening up his files and making himself available for a whole week that I spent up there. It was really worth taking the time to go up there and he was very gracious in that and my research was much richer for it. So thank you, Tad. Um, Tad's got a new book. It's called The Upside of Down, Catastrophe, Creativity, and the Renewal of Civilizations. Uh, it's available outside, I hope you will pick it up. As I think many of you know, Tad is the director of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Toronto, where he's also a professor of political science and um, has been kind of a, a key figure in driving a broad uh, research agenda on a number of these ideas and bringing them together, which is really what he does in this book, and including actually some of his um, uh, past efforts as well, whether it was the ingenuity gap or Environment, Scarcity, and Violence, the book that kind of captured that 10 years of research on the environment as a cause of conflict thesis. Uh, these past books have won some awards and we'll um, look for and expect the current one too as well. Uh, um, I think it's, uh, it, it's fair to say that this is um, uh, encapsulating a lot of that early work but in many ways going beyond it and helping us think even in broader terms and helping us make some of these connections. So we're, we're very pleased that he's, he's here today to do that. Uh, I should say this meeting as are many of our meetings here at the Wilson Center under the Environmental Change and Security Program rubric is made possible by the generous support of USAID and particularly the Office of Population and Reproductive Growth that is helping us uh, and supporting us in trying to understand some of these linkages among what are unfortunately in this town and as well in academia, often siloed fields that don't talk with one another, whether it's in the role of practitioner, whether it's the role of scholar. And so in that way, we feel very lucky to have the support to bring these worlds together in discussions that you know, we, don't, we don't live our lives in these little silos, that we live our lives in integrated complex ways. And so we need to talk about them and analyze them and, and address those issues in that way too. So um, we're thrilled that uh, Tad will present his ideas here and we'll have a lively discussion. Look forward to it. Uh, and so please, Tad, the is yours. Thank you, Jeff. And it's marvelous to be back at the Woodrow Wilson Center and to see some of my old friends here in the audience. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my new book, The Upside of Down, Catastrophe, Creativity, and the Renewal of Civilization. And this is really an extension of uh, thinking that I've been developing over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. In fact, in some ways, I suggest that this is the culmination of almost 30 years of thought about, in a sense, the predicament of humankind. Uh, I'm going to begin with the story. 
and it's a story that that you're quite familiar with. Uh, it's about San Francisco in 1906, early in the morning on April the 18th, 1906. Just over a hundred years ago, a massive earthquake hit San Francisco. It shattered the city's cast iron water mains. It tipped over kerosene lamps, uh, coal-fired stoves, tore apart uh, uh, town gas pipelines, it was kind of natural gas. And, uh, and when there were sparks, we had, uh, we had fire in amongst the, uh, the wooden remnants of the shattered buildings because much of San Francisco at the time was built out of wood. And by the next day, there was an enormous fire. And it seems like perhaps I can't get my next slide. And that was a punchline, by the way, and, and we don't seem to be getting anywhere. So let's see if I can work this out quickly. There we go. By the next day, there was an enormous fire uh, that eventually consumed almost 10 square kilometers of the city. Three or four days hence, hundreds of thousands of people were without food and shelter. There were fears of an epidemic. And this was clearly a catastrophe for the city of San Francisco. What most people don't realize, though, is that this calamity created both the motive and opportunity for enormous creativity in and beyond the city. Not only for renewal of San Francisco, but also, as it turns out, for the creation of one of the most important institutions of the 20th century, one of the most important institutions of the modern world, I would say. I'm not going to tell you that complete story right now. I'll return to it at the end of my presentation. But San Francisco is, is a good illustration of the general idea of what I call rebirth through breakdown or creative response to catastrophe. The thesis of my book is pretty straightforward, and it's something that I think at least everybody has given some thought to. I argue that we're in grave trouble, and by we I mean the human species. But there's hope precisely because we're in grave trouble. But whether we can exploit and realize that hope is going to largely depend upon what we do now in terms of our planning for the future. My argument's divided into two parts, diagnosis and prescription. And so the first two-thirds to three-quarters of my talk today will be about the diagnosis, because I think we need to have a better understanding of the challenges that we face before we can really start to talk in creative ways about what we should do. My diagnosis is a bit like an onion, and we need to peel away the layers. And I'll peel away several layers in my talk this morning at the uppermost level, we have the initial analysis, and then I want to go deeper and look at some deeper forces and issues that will help us understand the challenge we face. So let's talk about the first layer of my diagnosis. The key idea here, and this reflects something that Jeff just said, is that we're confronting converging simultaneous stresses. I think we all tend to silo our, our analyses of the problems the world faces. It's a natural thing within universities because of disciplinary barriers. It's a natural thing within public policy settings because of the institutional frameworks within which we work. And that means that we tend to focus on problems in isolation from each other. But I think the real challenge we face is that there are a whole bunch of things happening and, and uh, trajectories moving in the wrong direction at the same time, and we have to deal with them all simultaneously. And there's a risk that this is going to, that this convergence of simultaneous stresses is going to overload our national and international institutions. We aren't seeing the whole effectively. And we need to see the whole because recent research on theories of revolution and theories of societal collapse has shown that societies are in the greatest trouble when they're confronted by multiple stresses. Revolutions seem to be most likely when, when uh, there are stresses affecting the state and elites and the masses within the society simultaneously. 
because this is more likely to overload the institutions and the adaptive capacity of societies. And it's that kind of situation of multiple simultaneous stresses that, that risks overloading our institutions that I think we're seeing in the world today. Now, I develop explicitly an earthquake model of social breakdown in this book. And I think about tectonic stresses operating under the surface of our societies and of global society. Just as you would with an earthquake where you have pressures building up under the surface, potential energy growing within the system, and then some small event, perhaps not something that we could even understand, releases those pressures and, they, and, it cause, and the earthquake causes catastrophic damage. I identify five tectonic stresses in our world, and I'm going to walk through them over the next few minutes so that you can see exactly how my argument works. The first is demographic pressure. Now, this isn't just about population growth. In fact, I'm not terribly interested in population growth per se. I think the real challenge that we face in the world is, arises in many respects because of differential population growth between regions that are adjacent to each other, where you have a region that might have static or even declining population adjacent to a region that has still rapidly growing population. And this sets up enormous social stresses along that boundary. And one of the places where this problem is most obvious is Europe. Now here we have some data from the Population Council from Paul Domain. Uh, a demographer at the Population Council that compare the population of Europe and its hinterland over a period of about a century. I'll explain the, the uh, diagram in a moment, but what Paul has done is he's taken the population of the 25 countries currently in the European Union and then the population, aggregated population of the 25 countries making up Europe's hinterland across North Africa and extending out into West Asia as far as Pakistan. These are the principal sources of migration into Europe. And let me explain what you're looking at here. It's very far away and I'm not expecting you to read the numbers. All you have to be able to do really is notice the change in the size of these population pyramids. I'm going to assume that everybody here is familiar with population pyramids and how they work. On the left-hand side, we have three population pyramids for the European Union. On the right, we have for North Africa and West Asia. Uh, here, uh, there's a comparison for 1950, 2000, and 2050. Let me just give you an indication of the figures. In 1950, the population for Europe was 350 million. For North Africa and West Asia, it was 163 million. In 2000, just a few years ago, the population for Europe was 450 million, and the population for the hinterland was 300 and, excuse me, 590 million. Notice that this population has become very young, a large number of, of young people within the society. That's important, as probably most people in the room know, because large numbers of, of young, unemployed men in urban settings uh, increases the risk of political radicalization in societies. Europe, of course, is a much older population. In 2050, only 45 years from now, the population of Europe will have declined from the current population by 50 million to 401 million, and the population of the hinterland will be 1.3 billion people. Now, Europe and its hinterland represents this problem in the most graphic way in the world, but it's present in other places, for instance, between Latin America and, uh, and Canada and the United States, and, is, and the, the uh, interface there, of course, is along the southern border of the United States. These population differentials set up enormous migration pressures, especially when uh, the rapidly growing populations are in poor societies. And of course, in, uh, in Africa, we're seeing large migrations of people northwards across the Sahara and attempts to get across the Mediterranean. Uh, and this is a photograph of a migrant's body that's washed ashore in the uh, beaches of Spain. Already there are severe consequences inside Europe in terms of a friction between indigenous European populations and migrants or second and third generation migrants. Uh, and we can expect that as these differentials increase, uh, 
the migration pressures will increase dramatically and the problems potentially within Europe will be exacerbated. The second problem I want to look at, the second tectonic stress, is energy scarcity. And, and this arises from the coming transition from a petroleum to a post-petroleum age. Now, I just get my cards right on the table here. I am an, a believer in peak oil theory. Uh, now, I don't want to get into an argument about whether the peak of global oil production is going to happen now or in the next year or in the year 2010 or in, say, 2020. But even the United States Geological Survey acknowledges that sometime within the next 20 years, we're likely to see a peak of global conventional oil production. And we know this because that's what we see in mature oil regions around the world. What I show here is basically uh, a graphic of the, uh, of, of the gap between peak and oil discovery and oil production. Oil discovery in a region tends to look like a bell curve, and then oil production follows somewhat later, also in a bell curve shape, and the peak between the two or the gap between the two peaks is usually somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to, say, 40 years. In the United States, it was about 40 years. The peak oil discovery was in the 1930s in Texas, uh, and, and peak in oil production was in 1970 in the United States. And, it, and oil production in the United States has declined since then, despite uh, bringing on large fields, for instance, in Alaska. Well, we know this is the case for many mature oil producing regions around the world. In fact, about 50 countries appear to have passed peak oil production. What about for the world as a whole, if we take the world as an oil producing region as a whole? These are data from ExxonMobil. What we're seeing here is a graph of time across the bottom from 1900 to 2000. On this axis, we have billions of oil equivalent barrels from zero to 600 billion. The lighter line is discovery, peaking in 1964 at somewhere around 60 billion barrels of oil equivalent, and then declining with some, uh, some brief periods of time of reversal of the trend, declining pretty well steadily since then. So last year, we discovered in the neighborhood of 5 billion barrels. Production has increased steadily. Last year was 25, I think, to 28 billion barrels. It's important to recognize that we're now consuming somewhere between three and five times as much oil on an annual basis as we're discovering. We're using up, essentially, capital that we generated in earlier times, oil that we discovered in earlier times. Now, conventional oil supplies 40% of commercial energy in the world and 95 to 98% of our transportation energy. It is a hugely valuable energy resource. There are, very, there, there are really no clear alternatives in terms of the specific properties of, of petroleum for some of the services, energy services, we have to provide, especially for transportation. This transition, once it starts to happen, once we pass peak global oil production, we'll have to move ahead very quickly. In mature oil fields, we see declines, declines in at least 3% a year and sometimes 8 to 12 percent a year. If that happened, for instance, in the Saudi oil fields, it would change the profile of energy prices around the world very quickly. And we haven't really come to terms with this challenge effectively. We're not investing anywhere near the resources we need to invest in energy innovation to try to figure out how we're going to adjust not just our energy consumption technologies, but everything from the design of our cities to the, to the fundamental nature of our economies. And I'll come back to this energy issue in a few minutes because I think it really is crucial to my overall <laughs> argument. The third stress is local and regional environmental damage, especially in poor countries. This is a photograph of deforestation in Indonesia. And this is an issue, of course, that I've investigated for many, many years and looked at the consequences for societies of severe degradation of water, cropland, and forest resources especially those societies in which large numbers of people have a subsistence relationship with local renewable resources. And, and in many places in the world, not all places, but in many places in the world, this degradation of environmental resources has 
fundamentally weakened those societies, it's kind of hollowed them out from the inside, especially in rural areas by weakening economic productivity in rural areas, undermining agricultural production, causing large-scale migrations from rural to urban areas, and by weakening the legitimacy and the reach and effectiveness of state institutions in rural areas. The fourth stress is climate change. And this slide is really just illustrative of the, of the challenge we face. You're, I'm sure, familiar with, with uh, this kind of slide. Again, years across the bottom, this is change in temperature and uh, change in concentrations of carbon dioxide. The uh, lighter line is CO2 concentration in parts per million by volume. It's increased by about a third since uh, the pre-industrial era. And the darker line is global temperature, which now is rising in pretty close correlation with increasing carbon dioxide. I think in the last two years, 19, or 2005 and 2006, we've seen a, a, a quite remarkable flow of, of uh, powerful scientific findings regarding climate change from a number of different quarters. And I think there's been something of a tipping point within the scientific community, even among those people who thought that climate change was a real problem. I think that for many people in the scientific community who are working on this, on this issue, it, climate change is now regarded a, uh, as a matter of really great urgency. And why is that? I think there's a recognition that especially in the Arctic we might be seeing positive feedback start to take effect. Uh, for instance, melting of Arctic ice changes the reflectivity of the surface, surface of, the, uh, of the ocean, means that more solar energy is absorbed so you get more melting of the ice. We're seeing some evidence of melting of permafrost in the Arctic and in Siberia. In Canada, uh, uh, insect infestations are starting to significantly damage, and this is occurring in Alaska too, significantly damage uh, pine forests. And there's a risk to the entire boreal forest in Canada. Uh, m large swaths of pine forests have already disappeared in Alaska and in B British Columbia, and the pine bark beetles have now crossed the Rockies and are into Alberta and into the boreal forest of Canada. All of this suggests that we'll see large releases of carbon from the boreal forest and from, uh, from the permafrost. And I think that the realization uh, of these trends within the scientific community has led some people to believe that we might be much closer to a point of irreversibility of climate change than uh, was realized previously. The fifth tectonic stress is economic imbalances within the global economy, especially widening absolute gaps between rich and poor people among and within societies. Now, I'm not talking about economic inequality here because you can have a decline in measured economic inequality, although it's not at all clear that that's happened at the global level. But you can have a decline in measured economic inequality and still have an increase in, absolute, in, in the size of the absolute income gap between rich and poor people. And that seems to be the situation that we are seeing in the world today. And it's absolute income gaps that are important in a world that's wired together where everybody can see how everybody else is living, especially the poor can see how the rich are living, because people are motivated by and made angry by gaps between incomes rather than by abstract notions of inequality. So those are the five tectonic stresses that I think are building up in many respects in largely unseen ways under the surface of our societies and of the humankind's global society as a whole. In addition, I identify two multipliers that increase the force and worsen the consequences of these tectonic stresses. The first is increase in connectivity and speed of our global networks and systems, technological and transportation and trade networks in particular, especially because of improvements in information technology. But in general, over recent decades, we've seen enormous increases in the quantity of material and energy and information and in the speed of material energy and information being transferred from one part of our economic networks to another part. And the density of connections among us all has increased terrifically. Now this, in many cases, has been a wonderful thing and has been good for us. 
But I think we need to get beyond the idea that seems to be prevalent within certain circles that the more connectivity there is in the world, the better off we all are. Some kinds of connectivity are good, and some kinds aren't so good. And the way I try to illustrate this is by talking about tailgating at high speed on highways, something that most of us do at some point or other. Uh, but in the process, we create a tightly coupled system. And if somebody makes a mistake in one of the cars, or a deer runs across the road, or a whole cluster of cars that are tightly packed together drives at high speed into a fog bank, this is the kind of thing that results. You get a cascading failure of the system. And I think what we are frequently seeing in many of our tightly coupled, highly integrated, connected systems in the world is an increasing risk of cascading failures. The 1997-98 Asian financial crisis is a good example, which, which spread eventually around the world. The movement of SARS from Southeast Asia, from Southern China, around the world in, in literally an instant. Within a week, it was in Toronto, and it shut down much of the medical system and hospital system within southern Ontario. These are good examples. Another, of course, is the August 2003 blackout that affected probably most of us in this room. These are, as I'll talk later, are fundamentally non-resilient systems. They are brittle systems, a bit like the water system of San Francisco that was made out of cast iron water mains. They, they break easily when they're under pressure, and they're vulnerable often to cascading failures because of their tight connectivity. The second multiplier that, uh, that I think we have to pay a lot of attention to is what Jessica Tuckman Matthews has called the power shift. And this is a shift of power of all kinds down the political and social hierarchy from governments and states and large organizations to small groups of people and even to individuals. This is often driven by information technology and the sheer analytical and calculating power that's available to people now. This laptop computer in front of me has about as much computational power as was available to the entire American Defense Department in the 1960s. And in those days, it would have filled a room probably five to ten times as large as this room. And today, it's in a box that's about four liters in size in front of me. And that's available to virtually anybody now. And it's a remarkable accomplishment and has been a source of, of generation of enormous wealth and prosperity and well-being for people around the world, these technological developments. But of course, one of the things that's also moving down the, the hierarchy in terms of a power shift, one form of power, is the power to destroy things and people. And those of us who've worked in this area and the experts who are focusing on, on the problem of diffusion of the potentially weapons of mass destruction into the hands of small groups, terrorist groups, for example, are particularly worried about the diffusion of highly enriched uranium. And most of you in this room are probably quite familiar with this issue, but I talk a lot to general audiences, and I try to, I try to communicate the, the difficulty we have, the challenge we have in terms of Murphy's Law in controlling leakage of highly enriched uranium uh, into, into criminal networks and terrorist groups. Uh, I start by saying that it takes about 100 kilograms at most of highly enriched uranium to build a crude atomic device. And if you want to know how, read the current issue of foreign policy. It's pretty well documented there. There are about 1,000 tons of highly enriched uranium in relatively insecure storage facilities, mostly in the former Soviet Union. So let's look at the ratio of 100 kilograms to 1,000 tons. Well, it's about 1 to 10,000. And this is the way I illustrate that. The dot at the top is the amount of uranium you would need to destroy a city like Washington, at least the core, pretty effectively. And uh, the rectangle of dots below is the amount that's in relatively insecure storage facilities in the world. That means we need a control regime that's 99.99% effective. And I don't know anything that human beings design that's 99.99% effective or leak-proof indefinitely. And this is why people like Graham Allison have come to the conclusion that uh, there's a high likelihood at some point that some of this material is going to leak and we're going to see a nuclear attack in uh, one of our major cities. Not just in, in the United States necessarily, it could be in Europe, it could be Moscow, it could be Delhi. There are a lot of places in the world uh, that are vulnerable to this kind of attack. 
and w with and this would have of course a absolutely almost inconceivable implications for for our democracy democracies should it happen here and for the trajectory of human development now when i take all of these things together the the five tectonic stresses and the two multipliers i've just identified i see this as potentially a lethal mixture the convergence and simultaneity of all of these things is dangerous for two reasons. The first is what I call negative synergy. And that is the possibility that we'll see interaction across a couple of these different stresses. And it's very difficult to think through in a ahead of time exactly what these intera interactions might look like. Uh, one of the smarter things I think Don Rumsfeld ever said was his, his comments about the unknown unknowns that uh, the United States confronts in the places like Iraq. Well, we really we really are in a world of unknown unknowns right now when it comes to trying to think about how all these factors will combine and affect us in the future. But it is reasonable to think that, that they won't operate in isolation all the time. For instance, water scarcity is already very severe in many places in the world. Somewhere between a quarter and a third of the world's population already lives in water-stressed regions. You put on top of that the problem of climate change, and the multiplicative effect of the two stresses could be vastly larger than either one by itself. Again, for my lay audiences, I try to communicate this idea of negative synergy by talking about a particular incident in California, the great fires in the Los Angeles basin in October 2003. Now, these fires were a product of a number of factors that combined in an explosive way. There had been a long-term drought in Southern California, the worst in recorded history by that time. In part because of the drought, uh, the pine forests in Southern California had been weakened and were vulnerable once again to a pine bark beetle infestation that has now destroyed about 90% of the pine forests in Southern California. And in the, in the summer and fall of 2003, large swaths of forest around Los Angeles died, especially in the San Bernardino Mar Mountains. Immediately, uh, quantities of uh, dry material fell off the trees around the houses in the region. Uh, and also, of course, there had been long-standing attempts to control any fires because people didn't want fires in residential zones. And that brings up the last factor, of course, which is zoning regulations that had allowed people to build into forest regions beyond urban regions into essentially forested zones. And it was the combination of those factors that made for an explosive situation. You just need a lightning spark or an incident of arson, and, and then you had a situation like this. And this, of course, is a satellite photograph of the fires. Notice that there are four factors that are oper operating here. A drought, a beetle infestation, uh, certain zoning regulations that permitted construction in these vulnerable zones, and uh, policies and practices by homeowners and regional authorities that allowed the accumulation of organic material instead of, for instance, controlled burning. The second reason that I think convergence of factors is of great concern to us is that we could see circumstances in which we get simultaneous nonlinearities in certain regions of the world, basically uh, flips of systems to other states and, and uh, a crisis in more than one of these stresses, arising from more than one of these stresses simultaneously in certain regions of the world. And I can illustrate that by talking about Europe. Europe doesn't usually turn up on our watch list of national security concerns when we think about, for instance, state breakdown. In fact, it's never on lists like that. It's certainly not on the foreign policy list. Uh, but think about some of the factors that I've talked about here the demographic imbalance between Europe and its hinterland that's producing large migration pressures that, that, is, that are already generating a lot of internal instability in Europe, an energy situation that's becoming increasingly dire. In 20 years or so, Europe will import 70% of all its energy. That's not just natural gas and petroleum. Of all its energy, it will be import, importing 70%. And of course, as we know now, Europe is particularly vulnerable to climate change and instabilities in the flows of energy in the North Atlantic, especially the Gulf Stream. 
it's not implausible to think that there could be a situation in which at least two of these things go wrong simultaneously with really dramatic economic consequences, say an energy shock, and even a moderate climate shift that affects European agricultural pr production that would have enormous economic impact on Europe. And then you would see the already real discontent within the urban, and, uh, urban areas of Europe explode to the surface. So that's my first layer of analysis, the first layer of my diagnosis. Let's go down to the second layer. The argument here is that we're evolving into a world where we won't have enough high quality energy to sustain the complexity needed to cope with our problems. And I just want to stress a couple of things in what I just said. Human societies use energy to support and maintain, to generate and maintain complexity, complexity of institutions and technologies. And the more complex they are, the more energy you need and the higher the quality of energy you need in thermodynamic terms. And then we use that complexity of technologies and institutions to address our problems. In a sense, human societies, as they become more complex, move further and further from thermodynamic equilibrium. And uh, I use a, an analogy to explain this. You think of a, a bowl with a marble in the bowl. And the marble naturally wants to be in equilibrium at the bottom of the bowl. As you push it up the side of the bowl, it moves further from equilibrium. But you have to use energy to hold it there, the constant input of energy. And as soon as that energy is, is not available, then the ball automatically rolls down to the bottom. The, the marble oh, it automatically rolls down to the bottom of the bowl. And this is, a, this is a, uh, a way of thinking about what we've done with our societies as they've become more complex as we push them, like that marble, further and further up the side of the bowl. But we have to maintain enormous inputs of energy to keep them there. Now, this might not be a particular problem if we weren't going through this petroleum to post-petroleum age transition that I talked about earlier. And I want to explain this transition in terms of a particular variable that I found very useful in my research and figures prominently in my book, and that is the energy return on investment. This is the energy you need to invest to get energy. In the 1930s in Texas, it took about a, a, an investment of one barrel of oil, of the energy equivalent of one barrel of oil in drilling for oil in Texas, generated about 100 barrels of oil. In the United States now, the investment of one barrel of oil generates about 17 barrels of oil. If you go to the tar sands in Alberta, the backstop energy source, often regarded as the backstop energy source for America when conventional oil starts to decline dramatically in, in, uh, in the world, in, in its availability, the tar sands in Alberta have an energy return on investment of around 4 to 1. So we're seeing a steady decline in the quality of energy in terms of the energy cost of energy. As you get closer to one to one, you can imagine what the consequences are. You're absorbing a larger proportion of society's capital and wealth in the project of simply producing energy. And you have less and less left over as a surplus to do everything else you need, in particular to maintain the complexity of your societies. Yet our problems are getting harder. Climate change and our processes of adaptation to it are going to require enormous inputs of complexity and energy if we're going to deal with them successfully. So that we have, in a sense, a, a, a serious contradiction or perhaps an irreconcilable uh, uh, intersection of trends here that we need to address. Now, I tell this story in the book by talking about Rome. Rome is an interesting case because you can make a plausible, you can do a plausible analysis that suggests that the reason the Western Roman Empire collapsed, at least, is because of, of an energy crisis, that it was facing an EROI transition, an EROI transition that it couldn't get through. Now, of course, in Rome, it was an agrarian society. The energy that the society used, that Rome used, was entirely derived from food. 
Essentially, it was what specialists call approximate solar society. Solar energy fell on Roman fields. The food was grown, alfalfa or wheat. It was harvested. It was fed to oxen or to people. And the oxen and people did the work that built the Roman Empire. As Rome advanced as a civilization, it became more and more complex. Its, its borders were extended. The periphery of its territory extended out. Eventually, it was almost 10,000 kilometers long. Its cities became larger. Rome was, was one of the most urban, probably the most urbanized agrarian society in human history. Urbanization rates in Egypt were about 30%. In the Italian peninsula, around 20%. It had to be very clever in extracting sufficient energy from its countryside to maintain that urban complexity within its cities. It was able to do so early on, up till about the end of 100 AD, because it extracted large surpluses of energy from empires it conquered. When it captured the treasuries of other empires, it captured gold, and the gold was essentially distilled solar energy. That kept its energy return on investment low overall. But then eventually, when it ran out of empires to capture, it had to maintain itself solely on the energy that was available immediately from its fields on a year-to-year -year basis. And it was that transition, I think a lot of the evidence suggests, that ultimately led to the decline and collapse, an inability to deal with that transition that ultimately led to the decline and collapse of the Roman Empire. Not that there weren't attempts to cope with the problem. At the end of the third century AD, the emperor Diocletian recognized that the empire was facing a chronic fiscal crisis, essentially an energy crisis. It couldn't extract enough food energy from the countryside to sustain itself. At that point, the military required alone 200,000 tons of grain a year just to, to be supported. And so what he did is he implemented an enormously draconian taxation system for the whole empire, which identified every scrap of arable land that was available across the entire empire's territory, assigned it to somebody who could potentially farm it. If it wasn't farmed, it was arbitrarily assigned to somebody. If that person died, the land was again passed on to somebody else who was supposed to farm it and was taxed on the basis of having farmed it. And this allowed for a period of time the emperor, empire to, to extract enough energy resources from the countryside to maintain its army, its urban complexity, the dole within the cities, and an increasingly large bureaucracy. But of course, the high tax and rate, taxation rates in the countryside uh, eventually crippled the peasantry. You saw large numbers of peasants moving off the land, and that was, that was a crisis that at least the Western Empire couldn't cope with in the end. Now, what does this mean about the current? What does this tell us for the current world? Well, it suggests that as we go through this EROI transition in coming decades, we're going to see the great powers of the world, most of which are heavy oil importers already, energy importers already, take increasingly aggressive actions to regiment and control the, uh, the entire territory of the planet in order to extract energy resources to sustain their complexity. So that brings us to the third layer of my diagnosis. And this brings us back to the present. Although we have here still the past. I, I'll just take a very quick moment because it's an interesting story. One of the things I do to illustrate this, this uh, uh, energy story in the Roman Empire is I take the Colosseum and I take one uh, stone within the Colosseum, one of the keystones at the top of one of the arches on the outside, and I I run through a calculation, which I thought would be easy, be easy, but it took almost a year to do, ultimately, uh, of how much land was required to grow the food, to produce the energy, to cut that keystone and put that keystone in place. And, uh, and then we scaled that calculation up for the whole Colosseum. And it's a very interesting exercise because it gives you a sense for, for uh, the amount of territory the Romans had to control and manage in order to sustain themselves. The Colosseum, just in itself, required an area the size of Manhattan dedicated every year for five years in order to generate the energy to, uh, for its construction. Uh, Rome, the city of Rome, required an area the size of Lebanon, and the Roman Empire as a whole required an area the size of France. 
The third layer of my diagnosis, as I say, brings us back to the present. And here I'm asking, what are the deep drivers of our crisis, of our predicament, as I've described it? And this brought me to an analysis of the dynamics of modern capitalism, and especially what I call the growth imperative of modern capitalism. And my analysis here was driven by a curious fact, something that's puzzled me for a long time. We've more than doubled our personal real consumption of goods and services, our personal wealth in the last 50 years in rich countries like Canada and the United States, but we're no happier. Beyond a certain threshold of ten dollars to $13,000 per capita per year, the studies show us the correlation between increased wealth and happiness just breaks down. Yet we're still obsessed with getting more wealth in our societies. That's a curious fact. Why is that? What is it that growth brings us? If it doesn't bring us happiness, if it doesn't increase our personal well-being, what is it that growth brings us that's so important that we're prepared, among other things, to wreck the global environment in its pursuit? Ultimately, my argument is functionalist. I suggest that economies need to grow to absorb surplus labor that's disemployed, or displaced by constant technology, technological change, productivity improvements in technology. As firms compete with each other, they obviously try to improve their technologies, they try to improve their productivity, and technological change, of course, puts workers out of work. And we need the growth to absorb that labor. Otherwise, we would have insufficient demand within our economies for them to function properly. And we would have, as Marx pointed out a long time ago, a potentially revolutionary underclass. Now, we've been pretty successful at maintaining this growth. Marx thought we wouldn't be, using various kinds of Keynesian mechanisms. But it tends to swamp efficiency improvements on, in terms of material and energy productivity. In the United States, 3 to 5% growth is needed every year just to May keep unemployment from rising. But our energy and material intensity is improving by only 2 to 3% a year. We've made enormous strides in North America in energy efficiency and material efficiency in the last 20 or 30 years, especially in industries like the steel industry. But it's been swamped by economic growth. So the total throughput of material and the th total throughput in our economies and the total material impact and waste impact of our economies has stayed the same or has even increased. When you look at carbon dioxide output, for instance, America's carbon dioxide output has increased about 20% in the last 25 years to 30 years, despite the fact that energy intensity or energy efficiency is improved by the neighborhood of 30 to 40%. So this is a strong argument against the idea that we can decouple economic growth from growth in material consumption. And it's also a strong argument against what's called the environmental Kuznets curve, which suggests that as societies become wealthier, their environmental impact is going to go down. Yes, certain kinds of environmental impact does go down, especially the kinds that are visible to people and that, and that democratic action can develop around, such as air and water pollution. But what we've done in many cases if we, is we've simply transferred the environmental costs and environmental burden beyond the horizon in both time and space. An interesting example is the catalytic converter. It's helped clean up our urban air pollution, but it's also made our cars less efficient. And it's meant that, that at least that intervention has increased energy consumption for cars, increased their carbon dioxide output, and ultimately put a larger burden on the global climate. So I would say that technical fixes, while they might be important, aren't the real solution to the challenges we face. We actually need to address and perhaps change the underlying dynamic of modern capitalism. So the conclusion of my diagnosis is that, first of all, I don't think we can predict by any means what the future will hold for us. I am not into identifying places in the world where the wheels are going to come off first because of these pressures. But I do think we can say that the probability of some kind of major system discontinuities, 
of what I call in the vernacular breakdown is rising and perhaps rising fast. The future is going to be extremely volatile. Now that brings me to my prescription. And, and I start with the point the breakdown is not actually the end of the story. I think everybody, all of us, and probably most people in this room think, well, that's what we've got to avoid. Somehow we've got to, we've got to fix these problems before there is significant system discontinuity, to use a jargony phrase. But I want to start my conversation about prescriptions by saying that we need to get beyond a dichotomous view of the possibilities in the future, the dichotomous view that most of us almost unconsciously adopt, which is that we have one world, the ideal world, where we fix these problems, we adopt perhaps sustainable technologies, change our economic institutions, and perhaps uh, have incremental value changes that allow us to live in equilibrium with our, our natural environment. And we can continue nicely into the future along that path. And then the other possibility is cataclysmic collapse, the Jared Diamond world. Well, I want to say that there's actually a whole range of possibilities between those two poles of the continuum. And it's the places in the middle that might actually turn out to be really interesting and that we need to start thinking about. We don't really understand what the possibilities there are. Because it's those places that may offer us both ultimately the motive and the opportunity to produce really creative change in our systems. Now, I say this in part because research over the last 20 years or so, especially in ecology, has shown that the most adaptive systems in the world, complex adaptive systems, go through cycles of growth, rigidification, breakdown, reorganization, and regrowth. The breakdown is a, is a natural part of the cycle of highly adaptive systems. Now, we are very comfortable with this idea in certain domains of our thinking. For instance, in markets. We are very comfortable with Joseph Schumpeter's notion of creative destruction. Companies are born, they develop, they grow, they adapt to their environment, but over time they become so complex and perhaps so rigid that they no longer are very adaptive, and they might go bankrupt or they're superseded by other companies, and you get a change in the, in the actors, the economic actors that are operating within the economy. Whole sectors of the economy can grow and develop, ultimately become more rigid or inappropriate for a changing environment and be replaced by other sectors with different kinds of technologies. This kind of creative destruction is something that we're very ca comfortable with in our thinking about economic systems. We know that it's at the heart of the dynamism of Western economies. But when it comes to social and political systems, we don't think in the same terms. In fact, if we start talking about, well, you know, we need a little creative destruction in our political system, it sounds just a little bit offbeat, you know, something a little bit not wrong there. Well, instead, when it comes to social and political systems, we're locked in a management paradigm. It's incrementalist. Over time, it tends to increase complexity and rigidity. And most importantly, it never challenges underlying economic and political vested interests. In fact, complexity is increased often because you don't want to challenge underlying political and vested interests because, because they're, they're unchallengeable. So what you do is you add new modules of bureaucracies or rules and regulations on the side of already very complex institutions that allow you to do something but don't really get at the heart of the problem. I think that management is useful in many places and many times, but we need to start thinking more creatively about what we're going to do in the extremely volatile future that I think is coming down the road towards us, a future in which breakdown of some form is increasingly likely. At these points of breakdown, somewhere in the middle of that continuum, as yet undefined in terms of what we're thinking and what the possibilities are, we can call those moments of contingency. These are moments when there might be a great deal of flexibility and adaptability in the system, but it's also 
a time when our institutions and societies can be pushed in a number of directions, either positive or negative. Fear and anger and frustration among people because the world has suddenly changed will be powerful forces. I'm reminded of the famous line from W.B. Yeats's poem, The Second Coming, where he says, when things fall apart, the worst are full of passionate intensity and the best lack all conviction. And I think, think there's an enormous insight in that passage. Because when, when there are shocks in a political and social system, extremists of various kinds are quick to seize the psychological and political terrain, to define enemies, to stoke hatreds, and to instigate violence. It's up to the rest of us, and we'll define all ourselves for the sake of this conversation as non-extremists, as some of what Yates would have called the best. It's up to the rest of us not to lack all conviction in those moments. And in a sense, the ultimate and most radical argument I'm making in the book is that the way we make sure that is the case is by starting to think about what might happen in the future now and what we're going to do about it. So I have a twofold prescription. The first is to build resilience into our technological, economic, political, and social systems in order to assure that when system shocks start to develop in the future, when we start to see various forms of breakdown, they don't cascade into the kind of calamitous collapse that people like Jared Diamond talk about. Because if we're down at that end of the spectrum, it's game over. We will, will not have the adaptive capacity to effectively rebuild afterwards the way highly adaptive systems do. We need to maintain ourselves in this region of constrained breakdown in the middle, which is exactly the kind of thing that Joseph Schumpeter was talking about. We need to recognize as part of thinking about resilience that sharp, hurtful breakdowns are going to be part of our world. We shouldn't be surprised by surprise, but we can keep them from being catastrophic. And the key ideas for resilience involve increasing unit self-sufficiency, investing in inventories, increasing redundancy of key nodes. I'll just give you a couple of illustrations of these ideas. Increasing unit self-sufficiency or unit autonomy. I'm not talking about autarky. I'm not saying that every household should be able to provide its own needs. But it was sure clear in August 2003 that it would have been a good thing if some of us had had a little bit more self-sufficiency in the eventuality of a massive blackout. Amory Lovins, for example, has been talking for 25 years about the importance of distributed and decentralized power production. In 50 years, we'll look at photographs of our cities from this time, from the air, and we'll look at all of those blank roofs, and we'll say, what an enormously wasted resource, all those roofs that could have been used for generating solar power. In Canada, a cold country, we can generate 50 to 75 percent of the space heating we need for all our buildings, residential and commercial, by just drilling down into the ground underneath and using heat pumps to pump the low quality energy from the ground underneath us. Instead, we're highly dependent on a brittle energy grid. This doesn't make a lot of sense in a world where, where volatility might be a constant feature. We need to think about autonomy in core, increasing our autonomy and self-sufficiency in core in core goods and services, things like energy, as I just mentioned, food, water. I'm sure it's true in the United States in many places. It's a constant conversation in Canada. We're paving over all our best agricultural land. The, the, the largest piece of class one agricultural land in Canada is under Bay Street in downtown Toronto. Well, why is that? Bay Street, by the way, is our equivalent of Wall Street. Why is that? Well, it's because it was the first place it was settled. If you look around the world, you tend to find the best agricultural land is the most densely populated and is often completely built over. So what, how do we feed ourselves? We've got a constant stream of tractor trailers coming from Florida and California to, uh, to bring us lettuce and orange juice and fresh vegetables while we're building over all our agricultural land. That's not a resilient system. And I'm sure you can think of many examples in your own, uh, in, in your own regions. The second is, the second suggestion here for increasing resilience is loosening coupling within our systems so that you, the, there's less risk of the kind of cascading failures I talked about earlier. Here, what you want to do is, uh, in a metaphorical sense, increase inventories. And sometimes, not so metaphorically. 
we have, a, uh, we have a, an economy that's run now on just-in-time production. Great for efficiency and productivity. It's been an enormous source of growth over the last number of years in terms of growth in GDP. But it's also made our economies very brittle. In 9-11, when the American-Canadian border was shut, a lot of factories on the Canadian side of the border were, were closed immediately because their inputs of materials and feedstocks simply ceased, simply stopped. And of course, they had no inventory on hand. So we need to start thinking about, about what we do in terms of having buffering stocks and inventories on hand in order to take care of ourselves when things don't go quite the way we want. And that brings me to the, my second and last prescription which is about planning collaboratively on a large-scale basis for unpredictable futures and surprising futures. Non-extremists, in a time of breakdown, have to solve their collective action problem because extremists won't have a collective action problem. They'll be organized, they'll know each other, they'll have resources, their networks will be in place, and they'll probably have a pretty good idea what they want to do. Everybody else shouldn't be sitting around, in Yates's terms, uh, dithering. There needs to, now we need to start thinking about building common frames to understand our problems, to discuss what kind of values are going to motivate the solutions that we want to bring to our problems. We need to develop plans so that we have some ideas on the shelf for different contingencies in the future. And most importantly of all, we need to think about building social capital among us because the social capital, the networks of trust and reciprocity, will help us deal with the collective action problem that we'll inevitably face. If we know each other, if we trust each other, if we worked with each other in the, before, we're going to be much more able to work together at a time when things aren't going the right way. Now, I, I want to say that we've seen some examples of exactly this kind of advanced planning that have been very powerful, for instance, in the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine where a lot of advanced planning has been done by, uh, subliminally under the surface by groups to prepare for political mobilization when the opportunity was ripe. And we can see, have, have seen in that particular case what was accomplished by large groups of people working together. And I think one of the ways, and we can talk about this a bit more in a couple of minutes in the question, one of the ways, that, in question period, one of the ways that we, can, we, we might be able to organize people effectively to do this kind of thing is through open source architectures, which I find particularly intriguing, large-scale, voluntaristic, collaborative, non-egocentric problem solving, uh, focused on practical issues. I would like to see what we can do, and this is going to be the focus of my research, research for the next number of years, what we can do to create architectures, open source architectures that can be applied to social problems and not just technical problems like developing operating systems and encyclopedias. There is the possibility, I think, of what I call catagenesis. And that's an, a word that I introduce, which is a combination of the Greek, ancient Greek prefix kata, or down, and genesis, or birth. This is the possibility of rebirth through breakdown, regeneration through breakdown. And that brings me back to the story of San Francisco. San Francisco, of course, didn't end in 1906. It was rebuilt, and in many ways, it was rebuilt better than ever before. The buildings were constructed in ways that they'd be less vulnerable to earthquakes. What most people don't realize is that the entire water system of the city was reconstructed. There's a parallel water system in San Francisco that's available for firefighting, and it's designed to withstand earthquakes, and it has enormous resilience built into it large reservoirs in various parts of the city, pipes that are less vulnerable to breaking than the, than the cast iron mains that, uh, that existed in 1906. And then under 170 intersections in San Francisco, there are Im large cisterns embedded that hold up to 100,000 gallons of water that are standalone. There's a hatch in the middle of the intersection. The firefighters come along, they pop off the hatch, they throw in a submersible pump, and they get going fighting fires. Now that is a resilient system, but it was put in place because of a crisis. It was, the, it was the motivation and opportunity created by the earthquake and fire that ultimately made that particular part of San Francisco much more resilient. But there's another part to this story that I find even more intriguing when we come to San Francisco. And that is uh, 
uh, its, its implications and the effect it had on our economic institutions. San Francisco, of course, was devastated by the fire. A lot of the insurance policies were held in London. Uh, there was an enormous flow of gold out of London into San Francisco, which caused a monetary crisis in England. The Bank of England sharply raised interest rates and closed off export of capital out of England, which caused a financial and economic crisis in the United States, the 1907 financial crisis, which was the worst, one of the worst contractions in American history, with uh, bank runs all across the country. J.P. Morgan and his fellow bankers stepped in to try to save the American economy, and they found for the first time they couldn't. They'd done so a number of times in the 19th century, but in 1907 they couldn't. And the consequence of that chain of events was the recognition that there was a fundamental flaw in the American economy, and ultimately in 1913 the introduction of the Federal Reserve System, which was one of the most, which I think is one of the most important institutions of the modern world. So just to conclude, I have a conviction, and it's an unfortunate conviction, that we're actually going to make little progress on many of the challenges that we face, those tectonic stresses I have identified in my talk, until our societies experience major shocks. But these shocks can break through denial and create enormous opportunities for positive change. These moments of contingency will be fleeting, and to seize them, we're going to have to be ready. Thank you very much. Whichever you prefer. Oh, yeah. Okay. Terrific. Well, Spoken. thank you very much, Tad. Why don't we uh, have a Q&A? We're uh, webcasting this live, and we'll also archive the video. So we ask that you wait for one of my colleagues to reach you with the microphone. And if you could state your name and uh, where you're coming from before posing your question, that'd be great. Gentleman in the back corner, Sean. And then uh, Bishnu, and then we'll come over here. Thank you. My name is Bill Millen. I work for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, um, I have a question, but I, in your very last few words, you, you almost dealt with it, but, I, but I'd like you to revisit it. Uh, I, first off, I think you're spot on with your statements. I agree with virtually everything you said, but, but you've identified a key problem, which is that free markets are really, really good at allocating resources uh, uh, based on pricing mechanisms, but they're not good at allocating resources based on eventualities that may not happen for 10 years, 20 years, or 50 years. And so therefore, a business, for example, that practices redundancies and keeps large inventories is consistently less profitable than one that doesn't. And the only way that I can see of dealing with that is an intervention by government. You uh, do you have some suggestions to make? If you were a policymaker in, uh, in Ottawa or Washington, is there something you could do in the near future, or would you, are we basically just waiting for the crisis to hit and then hoping to take advantage of it? Well, I certainly think we can now we can think in really creative ways about what role government could play in extending our time horizon, the shadow of the future, if you want, or in economist terms, uh, uh, reducing our discount rate. Uh, but you've put your finger on something very important. I'm a big fan of markets as decentralized problem-solving systems, but uh, frequently they do have short time horizons. And we can't deal with a lot of these problems without government. And, and government is going to be a big player. Now, I think we're going through a kind of pendulum swinging process here, where especially under Ronald Reagan and the neoconservative revolution, uh, there was this idea that everybody would be better off if we just, you know, virtually eliminated government, just get it out of the way entirely. And then, you know, in the 1990s, the World Bank started to recognize look around the world and the places that seem to be doing well have competent, let's go from governments to states, let's call them states instead of competent states, capable states that are capable of creating the, the, the institutional framework in which markets will flourish. Now, if we're going to deal with something like climate change, and we need to get going really fast on this because the day is very late, we're going to need as much decentralized and dispersed innovation and as much entrepreneurship as possible. We need as many heads working on this po problem as possible. And the best way to start doing that is to start using market incentives. Some of that we might get, for instance, from a carbon taxation regime. 
but we can go a long way with, with a cap and trade system. But a cap and trade system, whether implemented nationally or internationally, is going to be an institutionally very complicated process. It's going to take a lot of government intervention. And, uh, and, and we need to, in a sense, get over it. This is not either or, it's both. Markets exist and work effectively because of government, and governments derive their resources and capacity in large part from effective markets. This is a symbiosis, it's not a zero-sum competition. And I, it bothers me to the extent that within public discourse, especially in the United States, it's still seen as a zero-sum competition. Uh, so you've, you have identified a really important issue there. Okay, uh, Bishnu Prati. I'm Vishnu Prati from Research Network of Nepal. Um, it's very interesting presentation. You presented this lethal mixture of five tectonic stress and two uh, multipliers, and it gives quite uh, fearing uh, scenario. But do you see any positive initiatives going on to address that? That is one. And the other point in your prescription, you said the um, resilience and economic, political, and uh, technological system is needed. Do you see that existing economic, political, and technological system has that capacity, or you think to need new one dismantling all these systems? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is sort of how revolutionary do we have to be? Uh, and I, it's hard for me to answer. Uh, look, my argument in, in a nutshell is really simple. Uh, in terms of my previous work, we don't seem to be closing the ingenuity gap. So we're probably gonna run off a few cliffs here and there. And we don't know how high they are. Let's hope they aren't too high. Uh, but in order to as land on our feet as best we can when those events happen, we need to start thinking about it now. Uh, and I don't think there, there are lots of groups and individuals working on these issues in various ways, but, but most are still locked into kind of a management paradigm. The idea of, in a sense, let's try to achieve sustainable development. Well, we're so off, far off the mark with climate change right now. You know, the consensus seems to be developing that we need to, uh, we need to cap carbon emissions somewhere around 450, 470 parts per million in order to keep warming to 2 degrees because after 2 degrees we really don't know what's going to happen. And we'll be at 450 to 470 parts per million because we're going to be at, we're increasing now about 2.5 parts per million. We'll be increasing at 3 before long. We'll be there by the middle of this century. There are long lag times in terms of the capital plant, power systems, transportation networks and things. We're way behind the eight ball now. And I, I think that it's likely uh, we are, as a result, not going to stabilize the climate. We're probably going to see significant climate nonlinearities. Now, my time horizon is pretty long, right? I'm going out decades. But that doesn't mean that we simply, to respond to the earlier questioner, and I think it was implicit in your question, that we simply wait till things go bad and then do something. My, I, I've mentioned two prescriptions in my presentation. In my book, I actually have four. And the first one is we do what we can to reduce the pressure of these tectonic stresses. So on climate change, for instance, that means do what we can to try to keep carbon emissions ultimately as low as possible. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm aggressively in Canada uh, promoting uh, carbon sequestration, uh, clean coal gas gasification, cap and trade systems. You know, I'm really hammering away at the government on that. It's, you know, and I, I, it turns out I'm fortunate in Canada. I'm one of the few people that has a high profile enough on these issues to actually speak out aggressively on it and make maybe a bit of difference. Uh, um, we need to do that, but I, I honestly don't think, especially when you look at the possible synergies among all these things, that we're going to we're going to have a smooth trajectory to a sustainable future. So we need to start thinking about alternatives. It's prudent to start thinking about alternatives and about what happens when things go wrong. And, uh, and, and that's really all I'm suggesting. Now, there are bits and pieces of it and pockets of it in various places. But I, I, I think that those pockets need to coalesce into a larger discussion. Uh, and, and one thing, for instance, we can be thinking about is what kind of economic system could we have in already very rich countries that isn't so growth-oriented, but that maintains social and political stability 
uh, when, when you still have a lot of technological change that's rendering people unemployed? That's a big question. We haven't really thought through what exactly the answers might look like. Well, let's get going, because there may be at some point in the future, there may be an opportunity to put some of those answers into place. Not now, because the system's too gummed up and rigid and locked into, into its uh, current ways of doing things. But in the future, that, that might change. Okay. Right, if we could go over here, and I think what we'll do is perhaps collect a couple questions for the sake of time and then let Tad respond to them. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is uh, Ingrid Knutson. I'm with the Canadian Mission to the Organization of American States. Um, your presentation was wonderful. There were no surprises. You hit on a number of different elements that I think many of us would collectively have put as tectonic uh, stresses. You even touched upon terrorism and uh, weapons of mass destruction. I work in the hemispheric security uh, area, and I'm quite alarmed by what I'm seeing in terms of our region in terms of organized crime, violence, drugs, or the weapons of mass destruction with a long fuse as it's been described. My background is development and governance, and I must say this is new for me to be working in the area of security and defense. I'm quite alarmed by what I'm seeing and wondering why it wasn't larger in my mind before. You didn't talk about some of these issues. Is I'd be interested in your perspective as to the degree of alarm or concern we should have. Such as crime and drugs, for example? Yeah. Okay. And violence okay. generally. Okay, great. But, Dad, if we could save that just for the sake of time, because we haven't, there are a number of hands. Gentlemen, all the way in the back, and then. Uh. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. I'm Max Castro. I'm with the Foundation for Environmental Security and Sustainability. I had two questions. One uh, had to do with one of your drivers. Uh, and that was the growth imperative of capitalism, and you would have a functionalist explanation of it based on the need to absorb labor. Right. And I wonder if there, that's a sufficient explanation in the sense that um, you would think if that were driving or a concern, you might have, for instance, um, a continuation in the decrease in the work week, for example, in this country. There are other ways to take care of that problem, lower in the time age. It seems we're going in the other, in the other direction. So I wonder if there are other drivers, for instance, uh, uh, seeking a higher level in the hierarchy, in the social hierarchy, which seems to be uh, something that's very common. The other issue has to do with agency. Uh, in your conclusion, you said you don't think we're going to make much progress until there is a real sort of uh, critical point. And, and my question is, what in that critical point changes the equation so that agency can be effective when, let's say, in the normal critical times that we're living, you don't have much faith in its effectiveness. Okay. Did I, there was there a hand on this side? I don't want to be neglecting this side of the room. Okay, Tad, why don't you take the, the no. two uh, to start? Uh, let's start with Ingrid then. Uh, I don't talk about crime and drugs very much. Uh, the book was already getting very long, and I was already getting very depressed. So <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, I, I, uh, if I were to sort of plug them in, and it wouldn't be just plugging them in as sort of yet another thing, and we just have to shoehorn it in somewhere, uh, I, I would do it under the general sort of rubric of this hollowing out of societies and loss of institutional capacity. Uh, and I'm also concerned, as many people are, of course, and I'm not by any means an expert on this, on the relationships that we see developing between terrorist groups and criminal syndicates, especially when it comes to movement of potentially fissile material and revenue generation. So one thing I do talk about in uh, the book is the, is the uh, revenue generation uh, that some groups have engaged in, like Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah in Western Africa and the diamond trade, for example. Uh, there's lots of evidence that uh, uh, terrorist groups and groups with, with uh, antagonistic attitudes towards the West, uh, potentially dangerous to the West, are involved in the drug trade. Of course, we see what's happening in Afghanistan with uh, the opium crop. So I think these are truly uh, critical issues. Uh, and I see it as sort of a general loss of institutional capacity and control of territory. Now, the thing about control of territory I do address a bit in the book. Uh, there's been an assumption that, quote, unquote, zones of anarchy would, would necessarily be places that are, that are good places for terrorist groups to set up. Uh, and I think that 
in more recent conversations has been shown to be a mistake because uh, the Taliban provided an institutional order for al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. It wasn't a zone of anarchy. The Taliban was actually quite a capable state. It was just a state that was doing things that we really thought were awful, uh, but it had control of its territory. It actually shut down opium production in the last couple of years of its existence. Uh, we don't seem to be able to do that. Uh, and, and, and it was that control of the territory that allowed, that gave the space for al-Qaeda to operate. So zones of anarchy actually probably aren't really good places for uh, uh, sophisticated, complex international terrorist organizations to set themselves up. It's just too dangerous. You're not going to see al-Qaeda going to Somalia, for instance. At least it might end up in, if, in the Islamic zones around Mogadishu if those are stabilized, but certainly not when the warlords are and the clans are fighting back and forth. But what you do see in these zones of anarchy is much more, is, is a criminalization and extraction of revenue that can then go off, can be transferred to terrorist groups. Uh, let me just uh, quickly address uh, Max's, is Max, is it? Right, Max's questions. Um, on the growth imperative, I think this is probably an overdetermined process to a certain extent. There are a lot of factors that are leading to it. I talk about status seeking as one of the factors, for instance, that encourages everybody to, to uh, strive for higher incomes, even though the money that they get doesn't make them much happier, but they're in a status race with other people. And there's been a lot of research on that. I think you can probably generalize that across societies. Uh, I think you're right that there are a number of possible responses in terms of policy to the functionalist uh, problem that I identified, which is the problem of identifying, uh, excuse me, of absorbing surplus labor, uh, one of which would be perhaps having shorter work weeks. We could go into a long discussion about why that is not implemented as a policy. I think that it, it, it counters the interests of certain powerful groups in society, and we see what difficulty it's run into in France, for example. Uh, and so the alternative is to promote growth. So there are a number of possible responses, but there's some that are more palatable to the existing constellation of power within the society than others. That would be the kind of argument I would develop in response. But I also think that while my, as you pointed out, my argument and the forces I identify might be sufficient, they probably, it's probably not the only thing going on that's behind growth. Uh, agency and critical points agency at these, at these moments of contingency. What's going to be different? Now, I had a good answer to that as you were saying it, and then I got distracted by the other questions. Uh, I think that probably, it's, it, my answer really would focus on the denial problem. And denial is, is something that I discuss a lot in the book at great length, the psychology and sociology of denial. And, uh, and I think that we're deep in it right now, and uh, and it's because, in part, we have trouble seeing the particular kinds of problems that we're facing. Slow creep problems are not ones that human beings recognize readily. We tend to recognize things that develop fast. We tend not to be well adapted to a tightly coupled world. There's some really interesting research on this. You know, our brains adapted in an environment that was very different from today. And, and we're in a world now that really, in some sense, cognitively bewilders us. That's one of the arguments I made in the Ingenuity Gap. Uh, sociologically, in terms of politi the political sociology of our societies, uh, we have uh, uh, collective action problems, those of us who are concerned. Uh, we are largely atomized within the economic and social structures of our society, so it's hard for us to collaborate to actually bring about major social change. And the other thing is it just, it, in the end, given the constellation of power again, again in the society, we're really at a decisive disadvantage because those groups that want to maintain the status quo and are, and are in deep denial about the viability of that status quo too, but those groups uh, ultimately are vastly more powerful than those of us who want to bring about radical change. And, the, and, the, and the, the argument for radical change in the sense hasn't been made yet effectively. There's not enough anomalous evidence that's accumulated. So my, my story that I tell is a very Kuhnian story in the sense of Thomas Kuhn, that there has to be a sufficient accumulation of anomalous evidence to actually shatter the, the current conception of an appropriate way to solve our problems. And, and that's just going to depend on empirical reality to a certain extent. 
So what do we do in the meantime? Do we just sit on our hands and not do anything? Or do we think about what the alternatives might be at those moments when people are looking for answers? And there'll be lots of people, and just very quickly, if I've got a moment, here's an interesting example in the sense of moments of contingency and catagenesis is the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, a system breakdown. A lot of people thought it might be final for capitalism. Roosevelt used that opportunity as, a, as, a, as, as an occasion to fundamentally reform American capitalism and lay the foundations for another half century of economic power. Uh, and, and in Europe, the same economic crisis laid the foundations, was, was used by Hitler and the Nazis as a way of creating one of uh, history's most horrific regimes. That's a moment of contingency. What I'm suggesting is, recognizing that there might be occasions like that in the future, we need to think now about trying to push ourselves in a positive direction rather than a negative direction. Okay. Well, I'm tempted to, to ha take the final question because we are already over a bit. But uh, to ask whether um, the shock that we had here five years ago in 9-11 constitutes uh, a window of contingency. And if so, whether that window is still open or whether it is already closed? Great question, Jeff. I think it's closed, and I think it did, mm -hmm. and I think it was badly interpreted the, and badly used. The, the, and many people have said that it was an, a marvelous opportunity for the United States to start to come to grips with, for instance, this dependency on foreign oil. This, this was an, the American public, the world, wanted to do something. They were going and giving blood. The blood was useless. But if you'd said, you know, we have to cut our ties, our, our energy linkages with this part of the world because, as Tom Friedman points out all the time, we're paying for both sides of the war. We're, you know, and I'm saying we as sort of an honorary American at the moment. <laughs> the, 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 you know, we're, we buy fuel for our SUVs that goes to support Wahhabist indoctrination in Saudi Arabia. This is insane. And you know, you could tell that story just like I have right now, and the American public would have gotten it, and they would have changed their behavior. We could have cut 10 billion, well, how many billion, how many million barrels are we importing? We, uh, 13 million right now, something like that. I think it's 12 million barrels a day. We could probably have cut that by 10%, 10 to 20% by now, with a concerted effort to reduce dependence on foreign oil. An opportunity squandered. Let's not squander the next one. Okay, great. Well, folks, please join me in thanking Tad for the presentation today. Different from the standard fare, I'm sure. Yeah, no, but it's